Hello, this is Sunday Profile. I'm Richard Aidy. This week, the entrepreneur who thumbed his nose at some of retail's biggest names but built a hugely successful online business in less than a decade. Ruslan Kogan is 32 years old. He started Kogan, his online electronics and retail business, in 2006. Now, the BRW Rich List estimates his wealth at $335 million. It's an astonishing success story, especially when you realise his parents arrived from Belarus in 1989 with only $90 in their pockets, and he grew up in housing commission flats. Ruslan Kogan's built his business by selling consumer electronics to customers for much less than traditional retailers. He hasn't gone for brands, he's invented his own. But when did he first think of the idea? The thing that became Kogan, the idea started when I was in Miami on an exchange program. I had a scholarship at Monash Uni, which allowed me to go study abroad for a semester. And I arrived in Miami and all of the international students got together and we said, you know what, we need a mini bar fridge in order to make this a successful semester. And everything we'd learnt about at uni was all about Walmart, their economies of scale, their marketing, the, you know, basically Walmart's the best and they do everything the best and they've got the best prices. So we set out to go to Walmart and we went to, um, you know, caught the train, then the bus and then bought our mini bar fridges and then had to schlep them all the way back to the campus. And it was a full day excursion. And then we saw the next day all the American kids had FedEx drivers deliver their mini bar fridges to their dorm room. And then we talked to the American kids and found out that not only did they spend the whole previous day just relaxing by the pool, they also paid half the price that we did. So I realised at that point that a small online retailer can operate with greater efficiency than a Goliath like Walmart. So that was that was while you were on your years exchange. But there was also a, a thing where you wanted to buy... An LCD telly? Yeah, so after I returned back from that trip and started working in Australia, I went to buy a TV and flat screen TVs were the big thing at the time. And even though I was earning decent money and a decent job, I still couldn't afford one because, you know, this is back when they were like $5,000 for a 32-inch TV. And I thought, all right, well, let me see if I can get one elsewhere. So I started emailing all these factories in Asia to to see how much TVs were and to provide me quotes for TVs. And when they came back with their pricing, I very quickly saw that there's an opportunity in the market because a TV that I could land for about $1,000 was selling for $5,000 in the stores. Right. So I can imagine quite a few people being... I don't know, I'm going to use the word obsessive enough to do what you are just talking about. But what I can't imagine is many people then going on to go, actually, do you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to get those TVs. Yeah, so look, there are a few few things with it. One is that I've always loved business and creating businesses and ventures. And even from the age of nine or 10, I was running ventures in order to get some pocket money. My parents arrived in Australia in 1989 with $90 in their pocket. So from a very young age, I knew that if I want something, I'm going to have to earn it myself. So it was pretty common for me to have business ventures going on and to think of ways to make money. And when I saw the price of TVs and I remembered back to my days in Miami and I thought this is a perfect product for online retail because it's a high value product in a small box. So shipping it around the country is fairly efficient. You know, then I went and spoke to a few people and most people were against it. Like my mum started crying and said, you know, you've got a great education, a great job, and now you want to be a TV salesman. And certain business leaders I approached told me that nobody would ever buy TVs online. Online retail is for books and CDs. And then my mates told me nobody's going to buy a TV online without seeing it first. So all of that sort of stuff happened. But 
my background at that stage was IT and technology and I knew how to make websites and um, I'd seen online retail in the US and I knew that it would work. And your insight, and this is more or less still a case, isn't it, that was that you could source the parts and get them assembled by a manufacturer in China and then manage the logistics and still sell a product to a customer for a lot less than the traditional retailers could. Yeah, so, you know, if you break it down to the, you know, most basic level, it's the most efficient way to get a product from the factory to the consumer. The internet has enabled uh, companies to talk directly to consumers. You don't, you no longer need all of the middlemen involved, whereas typically products go from a factory to an exporter, to an agent, to an importer, to a distributor, to a wholesaler, then to a retailer. And everyone along the way takes their 15 or 20%. So the internet has enabled communication at all levels, including from a manufacturer directly to a consumer. And that meant that I could easily cut out all those middlemen and bring a product that's in mass demand to people for cheaper than they could find anywhere else. You say easily, but I mean, when you began, it would not have been an easy thing to convince a Chinese factory to put together an order of TVs for some young Australian they'd never heard of. Yeah, and look, the first factories that I spoke to um, I was just assessing which one I want to work with. Then I chose the one that I want to work with. And when I went to place an order with them and told them that I only want to do a small order of 80 TVs as a trial order, they laughed at me because China is all about mass production. They told me that, you know, we can't do this. And they put in perspective for me that a uh, production line takes a few days to set up and 80 TVs would take 10 minutes to manufacture. So it didn't make economic sense for them. And to me, business is all about win-win. Every interaction has to be win-win, whether it's the product you're selling and the consumer, so between the business and the consumer has has to be win-win. All of your supplier interactions have to be win-win. And I thought, well, the factory doesn't want my order. What can I do to make it a win-win? You know, I couldn't really place a bigger order. I had no money at all at at this stage, and I was relying on a pre-sale even for the first small initial order. So I thought about what I could do to make it a win-win, and I realised that all these factories that I had worked with, even though there were these multi-billion dollar organisations, their marketing material was in Chinglish. It didn't make any sense, and uh, their user manuals were lacking diagrams, their pricing spreadsheets were all over the place, they had spreadsheets with numbers centred, and I really don't like when people centre numbers. Numbers should be right aligned to the same number of decimal places. So I redid all of that for them, redid their pricing spreadsheets, inserted diagrams into the user manuals, translated all the Chinglish to English, made it look like a professional Western document. And I sent it back to them and I said, look, there's no commercial value for you in the one small transaction with me, but there's other ways that I can add value to this relationship. And I sent them everything that I'd done. And they responded a few hours later, thanking me for what I had done. And they then said that they're willing to accept my order and gave me an even better price than we had previously negotiated. But you just told me you didn't have the money. How did you, how did you pay? So uh, as soon as I had the idea, I started building the website. Then I pre-sold the TVs because I knew I had to pay a deposit to China. So that involves listing the TVs and saying they will be delivered in 45 days because all of the business leaders that I had approached with this idea, all of them, nobody wanted to invest. So I had to find a way to make it happen. So it all happened through a pre-sale. And you also micromanaged it, didn't you? That first shipment, it wasn't like you were sitting in Melbourne tapping at the keyboard. You got on the plane. Well, yeah, to make the first shipment happen, I I ran a pre-sale, which obviously meant that I had collect money from custom, collected money from customers and had to ensure that everything goes smoothly. I'd taken out heaps of credit cards to help fund it as well, so I um, owed the banks money. A few of my mates who knew what I was doing helped me out as well, and they took out some credit cards and, and lent me the money. So my balls were on the line. I couldn't afford for anything to go wrong. And as such, I jumped on a plane, went to China, got to the factory, 
And I even, you know, gave them my business card, which said founder and CEO. And then they found that a bit weird because they saw me, you know, down on all fours testing every single TV. And I tested every single TV to the component level, made sure that every input did what it was meant to do. Every chipset was exactly as specified and that everything worked perfectly. I then watched them load the TVs into the container, seal the container, and then I probably took it one step too far and I paid a taxi driver to hop in with him and follow the truck with the container to the shipping yard. Right. Okay. I can... I, I I do kind of get that. All right, so that was that was a few years ago. You've you've rolled on since then, and and Kogan's much bigger, more products than TVs. And along the time, you have got into a few scraps. So, Jerry Harvey, one of Australia's most successful retailers, you got into a bit of argy bargy with him. What was that about? Look, Jerry's an incredible businessman, and he's done some amazing things for Australian retail, but. At the time, he was saying that, you know, online retail is never going to happen. It's not real retail, that online retail is costing Australia jobs and all of these sort of things. And for me, having grown up with technology and running this business and making it happen and having better prices than uh, all the bricks and mortar retailers, I was on the other end of that saying, oh, no, the Internet's real. It's here to stay. And, you know, we have to live with it and embrace innovation rather than trying to protect businesses that are set up to function the way businesses should have functioned 20 or 30 years ago. And, you know, because there are a few other sad things as a result of our business leaders talking down innovation, because what I was seeing is that we have these amazing uh, universities around Australia and some great IT degrees and people from all over the world are coming here to study IT. And we've got lots of great Aussie talent, but the moment that finished uni, they were flying out to San Fran or Seattle or London because why would you stick around in a country where your business leaders have their head in the sand and they're talking down innovation and they're talking down online retail it wasn't a good thing. Luckily, the you know things have changed now. This is five, six years ago, and now every major retailer in the country has an online presence and is acknowledging that uh, digital platforms are extremely important to their business. Mm. In that time, of course, you've you've had a huge amount of success. You've now got a big, really big range of products across multiple categories. And this year, you did something which I don't think most people saw coming, which is um, started Kogan Pantry, which is food and fast-moving consumer goods, so like razor blades and batteries and shampoo. And this puts you up against Coles and Woolworths. What are you hoping to achieve there? Well, there's a few things. So one of the things we get to do in our business, uh, being a digital retailer, is have very close conversations with our customers. And that means... You can survey them and send and send emails and ask questions on Facebook and ask consumers what they want. The other thing you get to do is uh, see their digital behaviour because what people say and what people do are not always the same thing. So you can see what people are browsing on your site, what people are searching on your site, what they're searching for on Google and all of these sort of things. And that gives you an idea about the market and how to better serve customers and give them exactly what they want. And these sort of products were something that people were asking for and One thing that we realized with our business a few years ago, while we were mainly a consumer electronics retailer for the first five or so years, that the business model we've set up can work on nearly every product, that uh, the efficiencies we create in the supply chain can be applied across multiple verticals. So we knew people want these products. We knew people want to buy them online. And we knew also from various reports that you know, Australia in the developed world has the highest margins for supermarkets out of any other country in the developed world that we've essentially got a duopoly here. That's it. And They're so and, dominant. I mean, I suppose my question is, what can you hope to achieve? I mean, people like Stephen Noble from Telsite have said it will take a very long time for anyone to really challenge them. And there are, you know, there are specialist uh, retailers like Aldi which are, you know, which have bricks and mortar sites and are out there in the shopping centres. Look, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but our job's to show customers that th- there is another option. 
And when we launched Kogan Pantry, we sold over 30,000 items within the first six hours. Like it was an incredible launch. We knew people wanted other alternatives and we knew people wanted more options when it comes to buying fast moving consumer goods in Australia, but we had no idea to what extent they were upset at their current options. And that business has been a great extension for us. It gives people more reasons to come to our site more often because these are products you buy once a week or once a fortnight as opposed to something like a TV, which you might buy once every couple of years. Mm. So, you know, it's achieving what it's meant to achieve. But obviously, Coles and Woolies are massive, massive businesses. And uh, to challenge those guys isn't something that's going to happen overnight or in a year. This is Sunday Profile. I'm Richard Aidey and uh, the very successful entrepreneur, Ruslan Kogan is my guest. He's the founder and chief executive of online retailer, Kogan.com. I, I want to go back now uh, because you've already mentioned um, your parents arrived here, I think 89, they had $90 in their pockets and there was, they worked incredibly hard, but there was no money, was there? When we arrived in Australia, we had it tough. We lived in the Housing Commission flats. My mum and dad both worked three to four jobs each. My mum would go from uh, being a cleaner at one cafe to a waitress at another, come home, study English, raise kids at the same time. My dad would drive a taxi in the evenings, um, then uh, go work at the Victoria Market in the mornings, then go deliver pamphlets, and you know, every whatever odd bits and ends were available in order to make ends meet. Um, that was, I think, a critical part of my upbringing because looking back at it, uh, it taught me a lot of hard work and dedication. They they escaped a horrible place in order to give their kids a better life, and that was never going to be an easy task. And I've had someone point out to me recently, they said, think about what it takes to be an immigrant. You've got to drop everything you've got, take a massive risk, travel into the unknown and work your butt off for a potential benefit that might not even be there. And then think about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. You've got to do pretty much the exact same thing. And uh, that made me realize that even though my parents don't know a lot about business and, you know, they grew up in communist Soviet Union, so they don't even understand things like supply and demand or economies of scale or simple economics principles that we all know about, they did teach me a lot of my business skills through their work ethic mm. and determination. But the, the entre so the entrepreneurism though, does that come out of, of basically not having any money? So wanting to have money. Yeah, all that comes out of wanting things. We live in a great capitalist society where we're a consumer driven economy where, you know, you earn money and you use that money to buy things to make your life mm. better for you. And, you know, as a kid that includes things like footy cards and candy or whatever you want to buy at that, at that age. And when your parents can't just fork over the money and tell you, oh, okay, here's 10 bucks, go to the, go to the milk bar, you've got to find other ways to make that happen. And so it all started with the golf balls. It did. So in the Elstonwick Housing Commission flats where I grew up, there was uh, some tennis courts that were just past the golf course. And I used to walk to the tennis courts a few times a week and I'd see all the stray golf balls along the fence line that the golfers were too lazy to find and pick up. And once I walked into the pro shop and I saw them selling them for like $2 each. And I thought, oh, wow, two bucks a golf ball and I've just been walking past them. So I could pick up all the stray golf balls that I'd see, put them in egg cartons, take them home, wash them and then sell them back to the golfers at 50 cents a pop. And look, it's not huge money. It was $20, $30 a weekend. But How uh, old were you though? Nine years old. $20, $30 to a nine-year-old is not bad yeah. at all. Makes you pimp of the milk bar. Pimp of the milk bar. <laughs> I'm going to have a chocolate and my friend will have a caramel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by then, though, you were already fascinated by technology. I think you were building your first computer uh, while you were still in primary school. Yeah, so it was at around that same age because I really wanted a computer, but my parents couldn't afford to buy me one. So I used to look in the green guide all the time and do 
go to swap meets and talk to various people and, you know, found out what it takes to build a computer, that you need to have a motherboard, a CPU, some RAM. And I convinced my dad for my birthday, it was for my ninth birthday, to go to the swap meet with me and that I'd buy the parts required to make a computer. So uh, even though we couldn't afford one, I found a way to have a computer. This is when computers were a lot different to what they what they are today. And I remember one of the happiest days in my life was when I went to the swap meet again and bought some more RAM to upgrade it from 256 kilobytes of RAM to 512 kilobytes in order to run Windows 3.1. And did, that's, it, it, does, it is weird to think back to those times. But did you then use the computer to run the car wash business? Because you had that one going by the time you were about 11. It was used mainly to play games at that stage, but uh, I did use it to print the business cards for the car wash business. Should explain, because it wasn't just you washing cars. You organised your mates. Yeah, so what happened was my parents started giving me five bucks to wash their car. And then one day we drove past a billboard and it said something like, you know, half price car wash, only $40 a car. And I thought, hang on a second, I'm getting massively ripped off here. Then I got my school bag, backpack, and put in it a hose and a sponge and a chamois and all the stuff I used to wash my parents' car and uh, went walking around the neighborhood, door knocking, saying, would you like your car washed for 15 bucks? And heaps of people were saying yes. And it soon got to the point where I was too busy myself because there's only a limit to how many cars I could wash in a day and I started making business cards and handing them out and printed flyers on the computer and started handing them out in the neighborhood and um, I had my parents phone number on there but my parents at that stage still had a, a very heavy Russian accent so Whenever the phone would ring, I wouldn't allow them to answer the phone and I recorded an answering machine message and I'd answer it whenever I could unless I was at school and I was taking bookings, calling people back, got a few other friends from the Housing Commission flats involved and, you know, we had an army of kids going around the Brighton and Elwood area washing cars. It explains a great deal about why you've become so successful and, 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 you know, you're worth, I don't know what you're worth. I mean, it's speculated that you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. How does it feel to be so wealthy, to become so wealthy at such a young age? Look, yeah, I've, I've never even really thought about it because it, things for me haven't really changed that much. Like some small things have changed, like I fly up the front of the plane but my friends haven't changed. I still love a Macca's meal at 4am after a night out. I still love going camping and fishing. That's how I spend any downtime. And, you know, once you cast your rod, the fish don't know how much money you got in your bank account. So unless you're doing things properly, you're not going to catch a fish. So um, it doesn't really matter for things like that. So how much time, how much downtime though is there? Because I have, in preparing for this, read a lot about you and people say, look, 100 hours a week. Yeah, sometimes even more. It varies depending on all the things going on. I'm absolutely addicted to this business. I love it so much and I love what I'm doing. I'll roll over in bed in the middle of the night and write myself an email or check emails on my phone, sometimes jump up and and go do some work because I've had an idea and I wanted to implement it. It doesn't make my girlfriend too happy when I do those sort of things. The best thing about it is that I absolutely love the work. Ruslan Kogan, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Ruslan Kogan is the founder and chief executive of Kogan Technologies.